Here's some things I think don't exist. So if you're going to predict anything in the real world, here's some things not to use. I don't think self-esteem exists. There's really one scale, the Roman Tafferati made a self-esteem scale that's pretty good. But the standard one is the Rosenberg, and I can't remember how many items it has. 15 or something? Not enough items to really be reliable. I think there were, yeah, 25,000 published papers on self-esteem. Figure 10 grand a paper, which is a, you know, a comparatively conservative estimation. So you can do the math, 25,000 times 10,000. So that's the total amount of research funding that's gone into looking at self-esteem. It's like, well, what's self-esteem? It's a word. Actually, it's two words, right? But, you know, and, and it's sort of something you think you might have or not have, but, but that's a figure of speech. That's not an empirical phenomena. And so most of, neurotic, most, of extroversion, most of extroversion is just neuroticism, as it turns out. It's like if you have a lot of negative emotion, you don't feel that good about yourself. Well, isn't that a surprise? You have a lot of negative emotion. You know, and if you want to fix it up a little bit, then you can also subtract positive emotion from that. Because if you have a lot of negative emotion and you don't have a lot of positive emotion, so that's neuroticism minus extroversion, then your self-esteem is even lower. You know, and then maybe over time, conscientiousness starts to make a bit of a difference, right? Because if you're conscientious and you work hard, you can start to see that that's paying off. And Tafferati's done some work that seems to sort of indicate that. But, you know... The first thing that happened is everybody went on a self-esteem bender, even though the measures were pretty appalling, and even though you could, you know, model it with the big five. And then one of the things that happened as a consequence of that was that the whole California school system started to teach students self-esteem. It's like, A, what makes you think you should have high self-esteem? Like, maybe you're a miserable little worm. God only knows, right? It's not the case that you should have a good opinion of yourself in every bloody situation. You know, what if you're a bully who pounds people out in the schoolyard? Bullies, by the way, do have higher self-esteem than normal. So they're, because it's not like they're feeling bad about themselves when they pound you. They're feeling bad about you. And the best work, you know, the low self-esteem equals bully hypothesis, lots of people believe that. But if you read Dan Olwys, who's the world's leading authority on bullying and who's actually done something about it, what he says is that bullies have inappropriately high self-esteem, which is why they think they're in a perfectly good position to pound you out if you happen to be on the playground. So it's not like they're suffering from a you know, neurotic weakness of self-image. It's quite the contrary. So anyways, in the California school system, they tried to teach kids self-esteem. And you know, there's no evidence that you can do that first because neuroticism is actually quite hard to shift. So, and if we knew how to treat it, well, hooray, everybody would be thrilled about that, but it's not easy. And second, there are people like, uh, what's her name? Jean Twenge, she used to be a student of Roy Baumeister's, who claims that all that self-esteem training has just, you know, made younger people like you guys more, um, what do you call that? Narcissistic. Yeah, because the self-esteem becomes disconnected from the actual accomplishment, because you might hope... Well, you'd sort of feel good. How good should you feel about yourself? Well, you know, you might say, well, you should grant yourself the right to exist like you do everyone else. You know, that's sort of like a basic human right. As a human being, you're valuable. And then maybe you should sort of think you're about as valuable as other people roughly think you are. That seems about right, right? So the right amount of self-esteem would be your perception of your value within the context of a group. It's got to be something like that. You know, so there should be a concordance because, like, maybe you need to improve. Could well be, you know. And are, are you going to improve if you're feeling really good about yourself? Well, the answer to that is, well, we don't know. How much misery about yourself do you have to have before you're motivated to improve yourself? None? Well, that doesn't seem right. But we also don't know whether it's shame or guilt or anxiety or pain or, you know, these negative emotions that motivate you. Now, it's clear that if you have enough negative emotion, that can paralyze you. But that's like depression and, and, and you know, psychiatrically high levels of anxiety. That's not like low self-esteem. So that's a problem. I don't believe that working memory and executive function are distinguishable from IQ, especially G. Our research, we, we've done a lot of it. I've factor analyzed a battery of 10 dorsolateral prefrontal tests Done, given to 3,000 people. It's a big, very big sample. We haven't published this uh, for a variety of reasons, but one factor comes out. And, you know, and Carol's rule for IQ was you take cognitive tests, a bunch of them, 
You factor analyze them, you pull out the first factor, that's fluid intelligence. It's like, well, that's basically what we found. And so, if you look at the correlation between each of the single tests and the first factor, it's only about 0.3 or 0.4. But that's also what you find in IQ tests. You know, each individual test only correlates with the aggregate at about 0.3. But if you aggregate enough of them, you get fluid intelligence, and it's just as solid as a rock. So, um, emotional intelligence? Ha! Not only does that probably not exist, because it's agreeableness, it, you know how you always hear you need emotional intelligence to, to thrive in the workplace? It's like, turns out that's exactly backwards. Disagreeable people do better as managers in the workplace. So it's actually, if you lack emotional intelligence, you're more likely to be an effective manager. So an emotional intelligence is a great, you know, indicator of sort of pathology and psychology, because it was invented by a journalist. You know, you can't just have some word invented by a journalist and then go make a whole bloody, you know, enterprise out of it. You've got to find out if, it, if it's really there. And there's not a lot of evidence that it is. And what does it mean anyways? Emotional intelligence. What, what does that mean? I can infer what you're feeling? Well, is that IQ? Like, are smart people better at that? Or, like, Am I mirroring you in some way, or do I care for you? Like, maybe I can figure out exactly what you're feeling, and I just don't give a damn. You know, is that still emotional intelligence? Would, well, I don't know, right? How would you separate that from sympathy or empathy? And what, and what if you're over-sympathetic to someone? Is that emotional intelligence? Like, maybe you feel way too sorry for your children. So it's like you're all empathetic and all that, but you're not doing them any good. Or sometimes you would be, but sometimes you should say, you know, quit whining, go the hell outside. Because that's the right response sometimes. So, these things are not straightforward at all. And of course, emotional intelligence is generally measured with questionnaires. And we know the rule for questionnaires. What's the rule for questionnaires? Hmm? One of your or... That's right, exactly. It's measuring one or more of the big five, either well or badly. Okay. So, and, and as far as I can tell, that doesn't mean that personality has a five-dimensional structure. I'm not making that argument, because who the hell knows? I don't think it does, likely, be, although it's very difficult to say. But what the big five theorists have really demonstrated, as far as I'm concerned, is that if you factor analyze questionnaires, what you get looks a lot like a five-factor structure, and you can do that cross-culturally. And so, I think we sort of nailed the question of how are questionnaires structured? So you can't just invent some new thing and term it something and then pretend it's something new without testing it against. And I would test it against IQ because that bloody thing... We know, for example, IQ eats up most of the variance in disgust sensitivity scales. You'd think, well, why, why would IQ be related to disgust sensitivity? It's, it's inversely related, by the way. The smarter you are, the less sensitive you are to disgust. Now, I don't know if that's because maybe your cortical inhibition of underlying, like, limbic limbic motivational systems is better? Who the hell knows? We don't know why, but we do know that it's a major predictor. Orderliness also predicts, but the thing about IQ is that it predicts things that you'd never expect. So you should validate your scale against IQ and against the big five, and not some trivial little ten item measure of the big five either, because then if you use two questions per trait, you're going to have a lousy measure of the big five, and if your stupid questionnaire predicts over and above that, all that means is that you didn't test it against you know, you didn't set it up for a good challenge, you set it up for a weak challenge. So, grit, that's very annoying. Yes, that's very annoying, because it's clearly, I think it was correlated, I think I told you this, it was correlated with conscientiousness at 0.75. I don't believe that optimism and pessimism exist. I don't believe that promotion and prevention exist. 